Shivo, you're going to speak for a few minutes, first of all, to kick us off before we move on to questions. I have been asked to speak for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to say that because often I'm introduced, the Chief Rabbi will now say a few words when I'm giving some major presentation. Uh, should I... Yeah, let me, let me stand. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so uh, the idea is that uh, I'll speak for about 20 minutes on our subject. After that, Jake and I will be engaged in conversation, further to which he will then open up questions to the floor. Enormous pleasure for me to be here this evening at JW3. Uh, lovely to have the opportunity to engage in conversation with the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. And lovely to see all of you. Thank you so very, very much uh, for coming along this evening. And I am looking forward to this opportunity to sharing some thoughts with you. And please don't hold back when the time comes for you to pose some questions. In Jewish tradition, foods are central to our very existence. For every occasion, for every mood, for every calendar event, there is a special food. So what is the food that we eat at times of sadness, at times of grief? It's the egg. It's a hard-boiled egg. We serve a hard-boiled egg at the beginning of Shiva. We have a hard-boiled egg just before the fast of Tisha B'Av. You've got the egg on the Seder tray. The egg is associated with sadness, but why the egg? There are those who explain that the reason is because the egg is a symbol of ongoing life, the chicken and egg process. The egg also is filled with hope for life in the future. But the explanation that I love most of all is the fact that the egg is one of only two foods which, when boiled, gets harder. All other foods, when boiled, get softer. Does anybody here know which other food gets harder when boiled? Sorry? Not potato, no. It starts off being really hard. <laughs> In Hebrew, the Hebrew word for it means heavy, kaved, liver. That's right. By the way, I, I see some friends from Ireland here, and when I was chief rabbi of Ireland, I was once giving this idea in a lecture, and the Irish Jewish community is full of larger-than-life characters. And at that time, there was a fellow there called Philly Rubenstein, and he had some wonderful things to say about everything. And I presented this idea. He said, Rabbi Mervis, you are wrong. There is a third food which gets harder when boiled. I said, what is it? He said, my wife's knedlach. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here you have it, the three foods which get harder when boiled. So what is the message of the egg? The message is that when the heat is on in life, we need to gather together our inner resources of fortitude to strengthen our resolve in order to confront the challenges that lie ahead of us. That's what the egg stands for. It's the Jewish symbol of resilience. And ever since the 7th of October, we have witnessed extraordinary resilience within the entire Jewish people. I paid a visit to Israel, a solidarity visit, about one month into the war, and I went to represent British Jewry, and to show our solidarity, and to give our support to the State of Israel. But actually, I received so much from the people of Israel who are so strong, so tough. The soldiers who heroically are determined to put an end to the threat that is posed to every citizen in Israel, and to bring the hostages back home. And the people they are absolutely determined to ensure that this threat will be neutralized. And that symbol of the egg is so true for our entire people right around the world right now. Yes, there's been an increase in anti-Semitism, but at the same time, I've been out and about to numerous communities, numerous campuses. I've engaged with students right around the UK, and I've been so impressed by the spirit of our community confronting the challenges that lie ahead of us right now. We speak about resilience, but actually it's not the best of terms. It comes from a Latin word which means to rebound. 
The idea of resilience, therefore, is you go back to square one. But it doesn't make sense. Because we can't go back to the 6th of October. You just can't do that. If we've endured sadness, gone through tragedies, you can never turn the clock back. You have to face reality. The Hebrew word for resilience is chosen. And uh, that relates to a concept whereby we believe you're adding an extra thick skin onto yourself to guarantee that you will be inoculated. So chosen is inoculation. As if to suggest, okay, now with this resilience, I've got a body of steel. I've got nerves of steel. Nothing can affect me. But that's not true. We're all human. So we actually need a different concept. And in Jewish tradition, we have one that's called nechama. Nechama literally means comfort or consolation. But in a Torah context, nechama refers to change. Ki nichamti ki asitim. That's what God declared before the flood. He said, nichamti. He said, things have changed. I need to change the way of the world and the future of the world. Hashem had nechama, meaning he took a new direction. And therefore, when we engage in nechama, what's incorporated into that is an opportunity to change our ways and change our life. And this is a powerful thought. You can't live an average lifespan without sadness, without tragedy. And in my experience, I found that the best response to sadness is not just by sitting still and wishing that it never happened, because then you'll wallow in your grief, and that's not going to help. The best possible thing to do, do something new. Do something creative. Change something. Join a new committee. Take on a new hobby. Whatever it might be, engage proactively in something constructive, and you will find that that is what brings consolation. We find that throughout Jewish history, it has been nechama which has saved the Jewish people, our capacity to change under duress, to engage in a paradigm shift. That's what happened in the year 70 when the Romans destroyed our temple. The end of many centuries of temple worship, the epicenter, not just of our activity or our geopolitical life, but of our very faith had been destroyed. So what was our response to it? It was the building of Yavne, it was the opening of a yeshiva, it was the commencement of Torah study, it was the production of the Talmud. That's how we responded. The opening of synagogues, a new reality for a new era to give us hope, to give us a future. After the Spanish Inquisition and the expulsion in 1492, how did we respond to that tragedy? The response was, through Kabbalah. Jewish mystics charted the way forward for us, and Kabbalah came to the fore of Jewish thought. In the aftermath of the Chmelnitsky massacres in the 17th century, our response was the birth of Hasidism. That is why and how the Hasidic movement came about as a joyous Jewish response to life in the wake of a tragedy in which more than one million Jewish people had been massacred. And what was our response to the Shoah? It was the creation of the state of Israel, so swiftly thereafter. And also the spreading of opportunities for Torah study. And as a result in the world today, we have more established Torah study opportunities than ever before in the history of the world. That is what is keeping us going. I have no doubt that in the future, humankind will look back on the 7th of October, 2023, and we will see it as a major turning point. How major? We don't know right now. And actually, in many respects, it depends on our response. To what degree will we have the courage to engage in a paradigm shift, to engage in nechama, to change things for the better in the wake of this tragedy, to guarantee that the silver linings of these exceptionally dark and tragic clouds will bring a blessing for us, and for others within our future. So in what ways can we engage in Nechama? First of all, let's appreciate what transpired on the 7th of October. Our eyes were opened 
to recognize the truth. And it's a sad truth. It's the reality of dark and deep evil in the world at proportions we had hoped would never exist again. You know, in the book of Genesis, Hagar was on the run. She and her son Yishmael were just about to perish from thirst. And the Torah says, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water in front of her. The Torah doesn't say God miraculously produced a well of water, but rather he opened her eyes to see the well of water which was in front of her. Because sometimes people's vision is blinded by their perception. And until the 7th of October, we were blinded. We didn't realize and appreciate the full reality of the threat that is posed, not just to the Jewish people, but to all of humankind. And now we know for certain. It's a sad reality, but we have to recognize it. Hamas is just one of the tentacles of the monstrous being, the head of which is Iran, which poses a threat to all of our societies. And as a result, it is crucially important now for the lessons to be internalized and for policies to be adopted and action to be taken to guarantee that our societies will be protected in the future from this reality of the threat to us. On a happier note, the 7th of October enabled us to appreciate how many wonderful friends we have got. You know, the heathen prophet Bilam declared about the Jewish people, Ki am levadad yishkonu v'agoyim lo yitchashav. A people that dwells alone, not numbered amongst the nations of the world. That's his description of the Jewish people. But thank God right now that is not the case. We are not a nation that dwells alone. We have many outstanding friends. Yes, there's an increase in anti-Semitism. And yes, in some circles, the silence has been deafening. And yes, some people who should know better have disappointed us deeply. However, we've got incredible friends. The United States of America the United Kingdom, so many other countries giving absolute support to Israel and identifying with the sorrow and the tragedies and the challenges of the Jewish people worldwide. Let us treasure that friendship. Let us continue to show our appreciation and strive to expand that network of friends because we need friends and we need to appreciate them. Since the 7th of October, we have faced quite a number of significant challenges in the world of interfaith. It's, it's a world that I, as chief rabbi, prioritize. It's an area of activity that I'm sure many of you have been engaged in proactively because it's so crucially important that we have understanding and dialogue and friendship and warmth between people of different faiths. It was here in London in 1942, that the Council of Christians and Jews was created by my illustrious predecessor, Chief Rabbi Hertz, and the then Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, right in the midst of the Holocaust, one of the world's first formal, established interfaith organizations. And CCJ, in the course of time, inspired many other interfaith initiatives. And today, I would say Jewish-Muslim relations perhaps eclipse the importance of Jewish-Christian relations. They're all important, but it's so crucially important for Jews and Muslims to get on well together at all levels. So since the 7th of October, there's been, and I'm now going to generalize in a global sense, there's been a lot of disappointment. First of all, there have been many wonderful friends who've put their heads above the parapet and who've shown their disdain for the terrorist activities of Hamas, who've shown their solidarity with us, and we treasure their friendship and their public statements of support. The silence of some has, has been very sad. The outspoken criticism of Israel from some quarters amongst many of our friends has been deeply disappointing. And I believe that as a result of what we have experienced since the 7th of October, we need Nechama, a paradigm shift in the world of interfaith. We need to commence interfaith Mark II. 
The first started in 1942. The next must start now in 2024. Until now, our mantra has been a reasonable one, a responsible one. Let's focus on all that which unites us, as opposed to that which separates us. And as a result, we will appreciate that actually we have far more in common than that which divides us. It's worked beautifully. So we've had Hanukkah lighting ceremonies, and iftars, and uh, tea and samosas, and all kinds of wonderful social events. But we have purposefully kept the elephant in the room in the corner. We haven't discussed Israel. For fear that our discussions about Israel could present such a deep ideological divide that it will be the end to our efforts to engage constructively in interfaith. So what has been the result of that? Since the 7th of October, we've been tested. We haven't been tested on that which we share, that which we have in common. We've been tested on that which divides us, and we have been ill-prepared. I would love my friends who are Christians and Muslims and Hindus and others to know about our concept of global Jewish mishpacha. We're part of one entity. Every single one of us is a limb of the Jewish body, and therefore, when hostages are taken from southern Israel, every one of us feels that pain intensely. We mourn. We grieve. Wherever we are in the world, on Hanukkah, we say in Israel, in the diaspora, in Sham. The poor and the sham are one and the same, here and there. We're all one people. I would love everybody to appreciate how we feel. I would love all others to know that Israel is not just the geopolitical center of Jewish peoplehood. It's the heart of our religion. We daven towards and through Jerusalem. It's the essence of our faith. I would like all others to appreciate that we have family in Israel. We ourselves might make Aliyah. We connect very strongly to Israel. We're proudly British. And at the same time, we're part of what's happening there. And I'm sure that all others would like me to know their feelings, their beliefs, their points of view. And I should likewise listen to them. There is so much that we have to discuss when it comes to Israel. But let's discuss it. Let's put it on the table. Let's engage in it so that we should be prepared. And as a result, our relationship will deepen. And I'd like to share with you a model of excellence. So in 2013, the Church of Scotland published a document called The Inheritance of Abraham. The Jewish community of Scotland felt very offended by the document. It was a document which discussed the concept of Zionism, the biblical right of the Jews, or the absence of a biblical right of the Jews to the Holy Land, the position of Christianity as having superseded Judaism, according to some scholars. It was a document which caused offense. In 2014, I addressed the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh, and I outlined the reasons why we felt so bitterly disappointed. And then what we did was, we established study groups, rabbis and ministers, who met regularly in order to discuss the concepts that divide us, how we and how they see the Holy Land in our traditions, why we felt offended by what they had written by, what they seemed to believe in. These conversations were tough, they were difficult, they were courageous, but they were highly productive. And last year, we published a booklet, a glossary of terms, going through all the terms that had been discussed, a record of these conversations. I recommend that you read it. It's available online. And once again, in May of last year, I addressed the Church of Scotland's General Assembly. 
And on this occasion, I came as a friend to thank the Church of Scotland for taking bold steps forward to repair and to heal our relationship as a result of which we now get on exceptionally well. And in the aftermath of the 7th of October, we appreciate deeply the Church of Scotland's comments relating to Hamas terrorism, support for the Jewish people, identifying with our plight. It's all as a result of the fact that we brought the elephant in the room onto the table to engage in those difficult conversations. That now needs to be the paradigm shift in this area and in others for the sake of our future. In this week's portion of the law, we read how Moses emerged from the palace of Pharaoh in search of his brethren, and he saw an Egyptian taskmaster striking an Israelite, and if not for Moses' intervention, the Israelite would have died. The next day, Moses went out and he saw Shnei and Hashim Ivrim Nitzim, two Hebrews who were fighting against each other, and he tried to stop them. And they turned against him. Now, this scenario that Moses came across is one which tragically has repeated itself time and again throughout our history. At the very time when our enemies from without threaten us, we ourselves tend to be divided within. That's what happened from the years 67 to 70 when the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem. <coughs> We were engaged in a civil war and it made it easier for Rome to conquer the city and to destroy the temple. There have been so many numerous occasions in which there's been unnecessary sinat chinam, internal causeless hatred within our Jewish circles. And that includes the period in Israel until the 7th of October, 2023. Such lamentable disunity that weakened us and it weakened our capacity to defend ourselves on the 7th of October. And therefore, we need to appreciate the wonderful Jewish unity which exists in our Jewish world right now. And there is an enormous call for a paradigm shift in terms of how we relate to our fellow Jews. In a similar way to how we need to respond in the world of interfaith, so too when it comes to our relationship with our fellow Jews. Because once this war is over and the dust settles, may it please God happen soon, I think we're just going to return back to where we were. That's how it's happened on previous occasions when there has been conflict. Wonderful unity at the time, and then before you know it, we'll be split and disunited again. So once again, what is necessary is we need to have conversations. We need to engage in communication. We need to ensure that we won't each be within our own echo chambers, because to a large degree, that was what was happening in Israel prior to the 7th of October. No real genuine communication and debate. And that led to unnecessary and tragic friction and hatred we need to be brave enough. Let's discuss the issues. Let's respect others for their view. The first chief rabbi of the Holy Land, Chief Rabbi Cook, I say the Holy Land, not Israel, because he was chief rabbi before 1948. He used to teach about Jewish unity in the following way. He said that many people think that unity is uniformity. They expect everybody to look the same, speak the same, have the same views. No, he said, that's not a Jewish concept. Jewish unity is a Jewish concept. And the best way to describe Jewish unity is in a comparison to a symphony orchestra. In the orchestra, every instrument plays its own unique sound. And under the baton of the conductor, all the sounds blend to produce perfect harmony. That is unity. And that is what we need today, to recognize there are other voices, other points of view, other customs. Let's respect people for who they are, give them the opportunity to express themselves in their way. Let's champion our cause in their presence. And under the baton of human coexistence, let us guarantee that we have Jewish harmony. We need to tackle the ball 
and not the player. Unity doesn't mean to stay away from engaging in debate, sometimes a fierce exchange of views. No, we need to be able to do that. But we need to respect our fellow Jews. We need to respect all of our fellow human beings. When I became chief rabbi, I called for Jewish unity. It was at that uh, installation ceremony that Jake referred to earlier. It was to be a priority of my chief rabbinate. And since then, I, I use an example for the world of cricket. I say we all need to be batters and not bowlers. We need to try to score runs for our side and not try to get any other side out. We need to champion our values, our points of view, our tradition, and we shouldn't define ourselves according to what we stand against, trying to bowl others out. If they differ, if they have their ways, gesundheit. hate. I made it known I would never publicly criticize any non-Orthodox group or leaders of those groups, and I haven't done so. In private, we have our discussions, we have our debates. And I'm grateful that our non-Orthodox colleagues have likewise engaged similarly. And the result is that, thank God, we have a healthy relationship today. And that is because we're part of the symphony orchestra of British Jewry, but we need the same to apply right across the Jewish world. You know the word tikva, so famous because it's the name of Israel's national anthem. What does tikva literally mean? Tikva means a rope. The first time the word appears is in the second chapter of the book of Joshua. Tikva is a rope. So what's the connection between the rope and hope? You see, when you have one single strand, it can easily be broken. But when you've got a rope, all the strands bound together, it's tough. It's unbreakable. So the rope presents hope. The rope is a symbol of unity. And tikva is only given to our people when we have precious achdut, when we have unity. And we have to change our attitudes and we have to change our ways to engage in that paradigm shift now for the sake of our post-war future. And finally, some comments about faith. When I visited Israel on my mission to show solidarity to the people of Israel, one of the places I visited is Machane Shura. It's an army base in central Israel. And it is at that base that you find there are facilities for caring for those who've been killed in battle. So uh, it's a sad place. It's the headquarters of the rabbinate of the Israeli army. And you have the facilities for a tahara, for those soldiers killed in battle to be prepared for burial. And so that was the natural place for the victims of the 7th of October to be brought to. Hundreds upon hundreds of them. And the place was just ill-prepared. They, they didn't have the capacity to deal with it. It took a long, long time to, to deal with every single one of, of the victims. And to this day, there are more than 100 bodies there still unidentified. We don't know whose bodies. Are they terrorist bodies? Are they foreign workers' bodies? Uh, who, we don't know. It's, it's such an enormous tragedy. And I was just in awe of our soldiers who had been treating the remains of people. And also at Shura, unexpectedly, they wanted purposefully to show me a facility which they call the world's largest ark, Arun Kodesh, an ark for, for Sifrei Torah. And indeed, it must be. It's a huge warehouse, shelves upon shelves on which there are Sifrei Torah. And there, sitting at a table, is a soldier in his uniform. He's a sofer, and he's correcting Torah scrolls. Which other army in the world has this? And it is from that ark that these hundreds of Torah scrolls are sent out to army bases, are sent out to places in Gaza, wherever people might be, northern Israel, 
where there are groups of soldiers so that they will have a Torah scroll to read from. And it was there that I recognized that, thank God, in Israel today, they appreciate not just the reality of Israel to be a physical living entity of Jewish people, but rather it is there for a purpose, which is a spiritual purpose. You know, there are two lech lechas in the Torah. The first was God's command to Abraham to make Aliyah to Israel. The second was the lech lecha to make Aliyah to Mount Moriah. Within Israel, there needs to be a further Aliyah to appreciate the reason why we have a country. It's not just a geographical reality, as is the case with all other countries in the world. It's there for a purpose, so that we can connect with God, so that we can live up to the divine aspirations for us to have an ethical and moral existence, to give meaning to life, joy in our lives. And that's what I saw there. The Torah scrolls are there to inspire our soldiers so that they know why they are fighting. And you know, there's been a, a sisma, a slogan for this war, Am Yisrael Chai. I don't think there was one person who kind of decided on the 8th of October, ah, let it be Am Yisrael Chai. It just came from our hearts, came from our souls. And I've been just so touched wherever I've been, from the prime minister downwards, breaking their teeth in their speeches, Am Israel Chai, everybody wants to say it. <laughs> it's beautiful, it's wonderful. But we have to realize there's a reason why Am Yisrael Chai, why the Jewish people lives. It's because of Od Avinu Chai. It's because our father lives. It's because God lives. Because God gives us the power to survive. And the way for us to have meaningful life is through a Torah way of life. And I've been so heartened since the 7th of October to see, and this continues to this day, many added numbers of people coming to our shuls, coming to our services, identifying with their Judaism, proud of their Yiddishkeit. And this too is something we need to engage in nechama about to ensure that further to this war, we will appreciate more who we are. Not just the importance of existing, to fight against anti-Semitism, to perpetuate our physical lives, but we're here with a purpose. And to appreciate that purpose through strengthening our spiritual identity. Because ultimately, the greatest key to Jewish survival lies in Jewish education and living a traditional, loyal Jewish way of life. And let me conclude with this thought. There are two concepts in Jewish theology. They are Yehud and Goral. Goral is fate, Yehud is destiny. Goral is the hand of cards that is dealt to me. Yehud, destiny, is how I play the hand of cards. We can't do anything about the hand that has been dealt to us. It's bitter, it's awful, it's tragic. What continues to transpire in Israel, in Gaza, is absolutely awful. The suffering of people in Israel, the suffering of people in Gaza, the suffering of so many innocent civilians and the loss of every single innocent civilian life, whether part of the Israeli people, whether Palestinians in Gaza, every loss of every such life is a tragedy. And this is all part of Goral, of our fate right now, of what confronts us. But it is in our hands to determine what our Yehud will be, what our destiny will be, that depends on how we play this hand. Let us as a Jewish people globally ensure that we play that hand well, that we engage in nechama in order to make the changes necessary to guarantee not just our physical Jewish future, but our wonderful and glorious spiritual Jewish future as well. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> Chief Rabbi, thank you so much for those um, very inspiring and, and, uh, and powerful words uh, this evening. 
Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jake Wallace-Simons, as you've heard, editor of the Jewish Chronicle. So first of all, thank you, Chief Rabbi, for coming here and joining us at this event, and, uh, and your staff, Mark, and your other team members. Uh, thank you also to the JW3 people, Raymond and, and your team, uh, who made us feel so welcome here and who have been such great partners on several events now so far, and we hope long into the future. And welcome to you, uh, members of the audience, members of, members of the family, um, and thanks to members of the JC who are here as well. Um, you'll see that there's lots of copies of the Jewish Chronicle dotted about around the room. You know, I've found that since October the 7th at the JC, we've really, it's been a struggle for us, as, as it has been for everybody, particularly in those first few weeks. And we have never needed each other so much at the JC, and we've also never needed our readers as much as we do now. And I would venture to say, if it's not too presumptuous of me, that most of you have never needed us so much either. So grab a copy, grab a free copy, there's one beside you, and if you haven't subscribed already, I want to know why. <laughs> so we're going to engage in a bit of conversation based on those wonderful words, and then I'll take some questions from the floor as well. I wanted to talk really about those three key words, resilience, unity, and faith. Starting with resilience, and you spoke very movingly about that, just to bring it down to a practical level, I think there are two ways in which people are really struggling with resilience at the moment. Um, the first is with regard to how Jewish people live their lives in, in wider society now. There's a, there, sometimes people feel they have to hide their Jewishness, whether it's school children taking off their identifiable Jewish uniforms on the way to school or schools being closed. or on, In the first week after October the 7th, I went to synagogue to shul, and the rabbi took off his kippah walking to shul. Um, so the balance between taking reasonable security precautions and giving in to fear and where that leaves us spiritually, I think, is one practical area that people need advice on with respect to resilience. And the other is regard, in, with regard to people's online world. There are so many people who I know who have got so consumed by fighting the fight for Israel online with people, and it gets to you after a while. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you have advice on these two areas with regard to resilience, Chief Rabbi? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, when it comes to feeling Jewish, it's really important that we feel proud of our Judaism. And we let the world know that we're proud of our Judaism. I think it's important we should let the world know we're proud of Israel right now. We're proud of our values. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that Israel is perfect. Um, just uh, today I saw I was criticized on social media because at a recent event um, I said... You that, appeared with me. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, um, I said, um, you know, what Israel... Uh, my, my context was Israel's responsibility to her citizens. Uh, and I said... You know, Israel's handling this in a wonderful way. And, and is, you know, what, what Israel's doing is really marvelous in terms of the responsibility to her citizens. Now, that doesn't mean that every single action of Israel is perfect because Israel is making some mistakes. Uh, and especially with the enormous challenges relating to um, trying to strike at terrorists who purposefully have placed themselves in the midst of, of uh, human populations. Um, so, like any country, Israel does make mistakes. But we can be exceptionally proud of Israel, of her values, of the values of Tzahal. Um, at the same time, I think one needs to use common sense when it comes to matters pertaining to personal security and uh, let each person make a, a decision uh, for themselves relating to the circumstances uh, that they uh, find themselves in. Uh, your second... It was about the fight that people fight online. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I've come across so many people with regard to social media. I tend to read a lot. Um, I'm just a details person, and, and I like to read. I, I don't have the time for, for, for all of it. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm interested to see, but it's not a healthy pursuit. 
You know, there, there are some people who just ignore it, some people... Who, we certainly need to have a break. I think it. people send, tend to feel they want to do something to <laughs> combat the wave of bigotry that seems to be all around us. And the way that people naturally do it these days is to go online, see the stuff, whether it's friends on Facebook who they don't know that well who suddenly produce stuff that they find objectionable. <coughs> they feel like it's part of the fight, that they're part of the effort in doing so. But I think gradually it, it tends to corrode you somehow. I think it's a personal thing. Yeah. Certainly those who are, who are out there fighting the fight, challenging those who are coming out with highly anti-Semitic comments uh, and, and threatening conduct. They do need to be challenged. They do need to be taken on. So I, I salute those who are out there and who are doing that. But I think, as in all walks of life, one needs to be careful. One knows oneself best. And uh, uh, you don't have to take on every single comment and everything and read absolutely everything. And, and sometimes I certainly do recommend a break. I know it's one of those reasons why Shabbos is such an incredible <laughs> innovation. It's a divine recipe for us to have an absolute break from social media. And sometimes we need more than one day in the week. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny, that, that first week after October the 7th, I was, like, you know, swept up in this hole in the, in the, in the wave of, of stuff. And we got to the end of the week, and uh, my, my friend, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me mentioning him, Rob Rinder, sent me a message saying, please take at least Shabbat off. <laughs> uh, and I sent him a message saying, but you don't understand, this is life or death, there's all this yeah. stuff happening, Hezbollah about to attack. And he said, that'll still be the case on Sunday, Jake. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes easy to forget that, yeah. you lose that perspective. Um, just to one more question on, on resilience. When people are struggling um, in those dark moments, are there any uh, stories or verses from Tanakh or any words of wisdom that you have found particularly inspirational to draw upon when you need a bit of strength? Oh, many, many. Absolutely. And there are so many, and our, our religion is just full of them. And that's in addition just to a general feeling and knowledge and faith in God uh, and knowing that Hashem will pull us through. Sometimes we're walking alongside God, sometimes He's carrying us in His arms. Uh, but to answer you specifically, um, there is one verse, actually, which resonates very deeply with me, perhaps more than any other. It's in Psalm 23. You set a table for me before my enemies. What does that mean? We're saying to God, and this is immediately after saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, etc. But you set a table for me in the presence of my enemies. So the best commentary I've come across is as follows. That the time will come and I'll invite my enemies to come and sit at my table. And I'll drink a lachaim, I'll say to them cheers. And I'll say, you know what you did for me? You thought you were going to crush me? It was such a good thing for me. You closed one door and it opened many other doors. I have so often experienced situations in which I've been let down by people only to discover afterwards that that presented a major turning point for me. It all depends on our attitude, how we respond to it, and, um, and it's really what I was speaking about before, that we can engage in change, um, easier said than done in many respects, and of course if one does feel particularly emotionally crushed, often one needs to seek professional help, um, because th there are many mental uh, issues that, that people have today. Uh, there should be no stigma whatsoever about it. It's pretty common, and uh, where we need help, let's share our thoughts with others. Talking to others about it is always really important. But for certain, what is happening now is not the last word on the matter. And, um, and often those silver linings become the determining, defining factor in the future arising out of sadness. And I mean, one of the, um, the good things that has come out of October the 7th, if we could say that, is, is particularly in Israel, is that unity, that achdut. And we've seen that so powerfully in Israel, people pulling together after, <coughs> after a period of what can only be described as disunity. Uh, that all seemed to be washed away, didn't it? And people coming together, including many more Arab citizens of Israel than anybody expected, which has been another sort of good news story uh, here. 
And you talked about unity. Yeah. And you talked about Ralph Cook's uh, metaphor of the orchestra, that you need everyone to play together and to create harmony. I think practically people, you know, now the Achdut is beginning to fray a little bit in Israel and here. And I think sometimes, practically speaking, when people are confronted with somebody whose views they find so objectionable, and let's, let's make this specific. Some people find, you know, anybody who supports Benjamin Netanyahu totally objectionable because, he, you know, they see him as corrupt and evil and his, he's, in, he's in his cabinet are these extremists and they are all beyond the pale. Other people see um, the other side as being against the state of Israel and anti-Zionist and how you can be Jewish and anti-Zionist and things. It's, I think it feels to a lot of people like there are some individuals who are playing a note that is dissonant, that doesn't harmonize with the rest of the orchestra. How do you deal with those people? <laughs> <laughs> Have it out with them instead of canceling them, you know, and uh, let's engage in the debate, let's engage in the conversation. Let's realize we're one part of one national mishpacha. Um, and uh, sometimes the debate can be fierce and can be intense. Um, but uh, we need to constructively engage in that conversation because otherwise, as I was saying before, I fear we will return back to where we were before October the 7th. Um, and it, it is sad that it is within the political sphere that this is played out. And of course, politics in Israel um, has a direct impact on existential issues. No wonder, therefore, that Israelis are so obsessed with it and, it, and it is understandable, but we need to be reasonable at the same time. I think if people feel there's just so much at stake, don't they? Yeah. You know, particularly with the future of Israel, as you've said, that the future of our children, our children's children, is riding on these leaders and their, you know, bad or good. Is there some s sort of way to remember the unity of people, the commonality that we have? Is there some shorthand or something to bear in mind that you think is useful for people to, when you're about to see red, just remember this and it will bring you <laughs> back to the center? Well, it, it's actually really interesting because when I've been meeting with notable people in the UK, uh, whether it's members of the royal family, members of government, um, opposition spokespersons, heads of the police. My message to all of them has been, we cannot afford to forget the 7th of October because that's why we are where we are today. Once you start forgetting that, then there'll be only one single narrative and it won't be a responsible one. We're here because of 7th of October and I think likewise, within the Jewish people, if we remember the 7th of October, which brought us unity, um, that will certainly serve a good purpose. But I, I, I recall a, a lovely anecdote which happened um, in, in the summer when I was in Israel at, at the height of, of, uh, of deep tension. So, you know, the flag of Israel became the symbol of the demonstrators and then the, those demonstrating against also took the flag. Mm -hmm. So what happened was you saw a video of people at the Jerusalem train station. Escalators coming down, escalators are coming up. So there's some who had just arrived back from a demonstration and some going to a demonstration for the opposition. And one said, take my flag. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and that's such a lovely thing because at the end of the day, they were all demonstrating under the same flag. Mm -hmm. And that's such a powerful thought mm -hmm. for us to maintain. We're here for the same people. And though we might differ, let's engage in constructive uh, debate um, as friends. Mm -hmm. and one phrase that's been going around in my head a lot is, every day is the 8th of October uh, from now on. That's how it feels often. Yeah, but, but it's, it's important that we shouldn't just define ourselves in terms of we are the victims of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. We need something well beyond that. Yes. It, it's what I was referring to earlier in terms of our spirituality, our meaning, our Torah values, why we are here as a Jewish people, and also the benefits of a healthy, a constructive, proactive Jewish way of life, which transform us 
and give us such pleasant and happy existences. Mm. Well, that, that brings me actually quite nicely onto the third point of faith. Um, and particularly, I was very interested in what you were saying about interfaith. And I think we've had this conversation a couple of times yeah. privately. Um, about a different kind of interfaith being required now. It's no longer enough to speak to our Muslim compatriots and to leave the issue of Israel totally aside so that they get to keep whatever bigotry they might have and still reflect, our, you know, reflect on our commonalities, which there are. But you need to take the bull by the horns a bit mm. and be more robust in the way that you stand up for Israel. Yeah, I, I recall in 2021 um, there was a mini conflict and um, it relates to two events at the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, and then spilt over and um, a Muslim faith leader in this country who's a friend of mine, he called me um, and in the phone call he said, you know, my 15-year-old son said to me, Daddy, how could those terrible people do that to us when we were in the mosque praying to Allah? And then he said, but you'll be pleased, Chief Rabbi, to hear that I reassured my son and I said to him, those are Israelis, but the Jews here in the UK, they're different. Now, I chose not to comment on that. It was a mistake, right? I just, because I wanted to get on well with the guy. You know, always would see him, chat, nice, friendly, etc. But it was a mistake. In future, I need to take him up on that. Mm. You know, and, and to say, no, actually, you need to understand certain things. And I need to listen to him, to hear what he has to say. We have to tackle the issue by the horns. I mean, I've, conversations I've had with people in the community, um, people often are very troubled by, um, by our, our Muslim uh, compatriots. And people see the, um, the demonstrations week after week on our streets, and it feels to people as if all Muslims are against us. And then when you have examples, like you've said, of Muslims who you, you know, friends or colleagues or associates or acquaintances that appear tolerant, but then you come across some re really difficult uh, prejudice. Um, what's your, what attitude and beliefs and, and orientation do you take when you think about um, Muslim Britons with, with, with whom we share a country? So in my interfaith engagement over many years, I have found that our engagement with Muslims is a closer one in terms of identity than any other relationship we have. In terms of values, in terms of um, monotheistic belief, uh, centrality of family, many customs. Um, and, and I've had some exceptionally pleasant and, and meaningful and enjoyable occasions when I've in, engaged with Muslim friends. Um, and that continues to be the case, and I'm sure will continue to be. Um, and I think we need to work harder to expand the net of s such connections and, and such feelings. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of understanding each other uh, and also engaging on matters pertaining to Israel which do divide us. Uh, and I think that using the Church of Scotland model, we can make a lot of progress. It will also be defining, because through the usage of that model, perhaps some of our engagement might be fruitless. And the differences might be so deep that we could recognize, actually, there's no way forward. Well, then so be it. At least we'll know where we stand, and, and we won't be engaging in a charade. But I am hopeful that through constructive engagement, uh, we will be able to break fresh ground. Uh, and I certainly uh, will be redoubling my efforts in this regard. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally take a lot of inspiration uh, from looking at uh, Muslim Israelis and how in the past you know, three months we've seen Muslim Israelis saving Jewish Israelis, sometimes giving up their lives in so doing, currently fighting for Israel in Gaza, standing up for Israel across society in different ways. Um, there was Naz Daly, the 
um, Israeli Arab social media influencer, influencer wrote a column saying, I used to see myself as Palestinian Israeli, now I'm Israeli first after October the 7th. And, and there are lots of other examples we can give. Oh, at, at, at a personal level, I recall when our daughter, Zichron Ali Bracha, was hospitalized on, um, Hadass, in, in Hadassah Hospital on um, uh, Mount Scopus. And uh, my wife and I arrived and we wanted to see the head of surgery in Hadassah Hospital. So we were told, oh, he's Professor Eid and his office is down the corridor. I said, Professor what? Professor Eid, E-I-D. And sure enough, the head of surgery at Hadassah is an Arab, uh, looking after our daughter. Um, if you want to see the potential for great coexistence, go to any Israeli hospital. Because human beings are human beings. Everybody needs to be hospitalized. <laughs> but not only at Hadassah are 40% of the patients Arabs, 40% of the staff, the doctors and the nurses, uh, if not even more, are, are Arabs. And, and it's a wonderful example of the potential that certainly does exist. And uh, there is room for hope. Yeah, here, here. Well, I've got a few questions here which have been emailed in from people. We're not going to have time to go through all of them, but there are, there are, we've covered some of them already. But there was one very interesting one, I thought, um, about the Jewish ethics of warfare. And you know, you, you've mentioned that Israel, like any other country, can make mistakes. <laughs> and it reminds me of that quote from uh, Zev Jabotinsky, where he said, as one of the first conditions of equality, we demand the right to have our own villains, as everybody else has them, yeah. which is an important, important yeah. thing. But there was a question about um, what the halakha might say <laughs> about this idea of disproportionate warfare. I mean, I know that there is a lot of teachings on, on warfare, on siege, on, um, on how to wage war. What, what, what does your learning tell you when you look at modern examples of warfare uh, in, in Gaza? So the, it is a lovely question. We don't have time for a shiur, and, <laughs> and, I, and I doubt that the audience isn't... Uh, in a nutshell, on one leg, <laughs> on one leg. <laughs> so, it, first of all, every battle, every conflict presents a different type of scenario. And with regard to what is currently happening uh, today in Gaza, um, I'm not privy to the information that the IDF has, th the challenges, the level of threat. You know, we're, we're referring to an existential threat. I think, to me, it seems that that is what the reality is, particularly when leaders of Hamas are talking about 7th of October, potentially, God forbid, happening again and again and again, and noting the barbarity and the cruelty of, of what transpired without the slightest slither of remorse and the, plight, the ongoing plight of, of the hostages. So, therefore, the, the need for Israel to engage in the war that it's engaging in is is clearly correct. Um, I mentioned before, and I'll mention again, um, the loss of innocent life is tragic, needs to be minimized, and my understanding is that that's exactly what the IDF is doing, often at a high cost to Israeli soldiers. And, um, but nonetheless, the suffering of people is absolutely enormous. And, and our hearts should go out to all innocent people who are suffering. But as to, I, I can't in a nutshell tell you exactly, uh, because it all depends on scenarios. But in the broadest sense, I mentioned before there is a rabbinate of the army. You've got many valiant soldiers who are coming from the yeshivot and who are fighting uh, along principles of halakha within the framework of what our Torah teaches us. Okay. Um, another question here, which I think has been on people's minds, some people's minds recently, has the new wave of anti-Semitism in this country following October the 7th made you question the long-term future of Jews in Britain? No. I, I would append to that that it's interesting that when I look back over examples of, of ex explosions of violence against Jews in the past, the, from the Holocaust backwards to York and beyond. It's always seemed that the build-up of everyday anti-Semitic bullying has led to an, exp an orgy of violence. But this seems like it's the other way around, that there's an orgy of violence that has given way to everyday anti-Semitism that's become the new normal. Does this make you feel or wonder whether the Jews have a future here? 
oh, the Jews have a, please God, a great future in this country. I'm absolutely convinced of that, alongside the existence of the blessed state of Israel and other opportunities uh, that exist. And um, for certain, um, I think, Jake, you referred, was it in, in, in one of your tweets on X Twitter to a comment of mine before the um, Select Committee, the Home Affairs Select yes. Committee, <laughs> which relates to this question. So you see, that was one of the tweets that I did read on that day. <laughs> but I only go to the good side. Because he reads my tweets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in, uh, it must have been 2016. 2016 it was. 2016, yeah. I appeared before the Home Affairs Select Committee holding a hearing on anti-Semitism at a time when Jeremy Corman was leader of the Labour Party. And uh, a question was posed to me, so Chief Rabbi, how do you rate the level of anti-Semitism in the UK? And I took out a sheet of paper, I scribbled a black dot in the middle, I held it up to the panel and I said, what do you see? And they thought I'd gone absolutely sugar. And they said, a black dot. So I said, no, 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 there's something bigger than the black dot. They said, what are you talking about? There's just this black dot. So I said, no, there's something much bigger. The black dot is about 4% of the surface of the paper, but about 96% is the white background. And I said, that white background, that's the happiness of the Jewish community in this country. We, we lead a great existence. This is a marvelous place for us to live in. This is where we have schools and shuls and kosher facilities and, and we thrive. And there are many Jewish people who have hardly ever encounter anti-Semitism. Together with that, we've got this dot and it's getting bigger and we need to be more vigilant. And unfortunately, since the 7th of October, it's now bigger than it has been before. But nonetheless, the overall life for the Jewish people in this country is good, if not very good. Um, I do see a future. At the same time, uh, we certainly need to be vigilant. And uh, we are grateful that the attack on anti-Semitism is not left to the Jewish community to tackle, but rather the fight against anti-Semitism starts with the government and all the way down because it is correctly seen that a threat to Jews in this country is a threat to our entire society. And, and we're fortunate to have a uh, head of state, King Charles, who's a good ally, a very strong ally of ours and a, and a personal friend of yours. And before we turn to questions to the audience, I just wanted to ask you, if, if I may, is there a little anecdote you can share of your time with the king that you've never told anybody else before. <laughs> as, as long as nobody from the Jewish Chronicles is around. <laughs> <laughs> off the record, off the record. <laughs> so um, I, I, I was exceptionally touched. Um, and, and, and by the way, this does not relate to me personally because it, it was me on behalf of all of us. Um, it was very soon after the 7th of October that King Charles wanted to express his deep concern for our community. Um, and uh, he did issue a statement. Um, and then he invited me to an audience in Buckingham Palace. Um, and, and it was a long audience. You know, when, when, one, when you're given the pep talk before going in for the audience, uh, one of the things you're told is all about the bowing procedure and uh, where to bow, what to do, etc. And then, um, and then you're told, after one of the bows, um, at that point, if he extends his arm to you, you shake it, otherwise not. And then he will talk to you while standing. And if he wants to sit down for a longer period of time, he'll invite you. Well, he definitely invited me uh, to, to sit down, and, and it was an exceptionally warm and, and heartwarming um, experience. And um, the, his message clearly was one of, first of all, horror at the terrorist attack on the 7th of October and deep concern for the Jewish community. Um, and um, I've actually uh, seen him twice since. Um, and again, on both occasions, he has reiterated those comments and that uh, deep concern. And uh, you mentioned that he attended my installation as, as chief rabbi when he was Prince Charles, and at that time we never for one moment thought he would do it because he was on holiday in, in Scotland. It was the 1st of September. Uh, but he came specially for the day. Um, uh, he is a genuine friend, and, and he does care. 
uh, and, and he cares about all faiths. And, and I know that at this very moment he is pained uh, about everything that is... Right, we've got just a few minutes for, for questions. So um, there's a roving microphone somewhere, I think. Um, so I, I must say that we're, we're open to questions of all sorts, but no speeches, and I will be brutal. Um, so first of all, where's the mic? Can I... It's, we have two, one there and one there, okay. Well, why don't we go for the, the hand there that's closest to the mic to start with, that would be great. And we'll take a, keep the question short so we can have as many as we can. Um, interfaith issues. Um, I have two daughters at university now, and I'd love to, for them to be able to articulate what a vision is for the two-state solution. That is something that can be supported by people of all faiths. And, um, for instance, the Abraham Accords, the UAE has built, has done a lot of work in this area. They've built three fantastic synagogues, mosques, and churches in one area. They must have a view about coexistence between Jews and Muslims. So is your question, how is the two-state solution possible? I'd how like to hear a, um, a statement of support and justification and validation of the two-state solution that can be supported by both Muslims and Jews. Okay, good, thank you. So, yeah, what's the vision of the two-state solution that both communities can get behind? Should we take like three questions and we can answer them at I, once? I just or fear that I might forget that? the question. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, as opposed to talking about two-state solution, et cetera, which is a, which is a political scenario, and by the way, I, I personally believe that the, the Palestinians um, ha have a right for self-determination, and uh, if the conditions would be right, um, then hopefully in the course of time, it, 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 we will have the makings of, of, of two states. Um, but you did mention correctly developments in the Gulf, and uh, I had the privilege of officially opening the Moses Menmaimon synagogue, which is part of that threesome, the synagogue, the mosque, and the church in Abu Dhabi. And I have engaged heavily with Muslim leaders in that region. And broadly speaking, I'm encouraged uh, through what they are telling me. And my hope is that beyond this war, the Abraham Accords will prove to have served well. And the spirit which accompanied the creation of the Accords will last well into the future. In fact, it is probable that the strength of the Abraham Accords and the potential for those accords to expand could very well have been the reason why we're engaged in a war right now, mm -hmm. because of the possibility stroke probability that Saudi Arabia could have entered. Um, and I have benefited from good friendships uh, and close connections with Muslim leaders in that area of the world, uh, and I am hopeful uh, for the future um, that we could see some positive developments uh, beyond the war in that area. Good, thank you. Okay, somebody at the back again, and then we'll come down towards the front after that. There's a chap there, yeah. <coughs> when it comes to, to warfare, Israel seems to be held to a, a higher standard than the rest of the world. Do you think this is purely born out of anti-Semitism, or can there be a, a different reason? My answer is sometimes it's anti-Semitism, and sometimes it can be all kinds of reasons. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in some um, areas of criticism of Israel, and, and you can sense it, you can pick it up um, through the media, that there seems to be an element of, of anti-Semitism in the style, in the tone, um, in the persistence, in, in the choice of, of subject and how points of view are, uh, are conveyed. Um, Anti-Semitism <laughs> is alive and it exists and sometimes uh, it is portrayed in, in those ways. But not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, far from it. In fact, some of the harshest criticism of Israel is to be found in Israel itself, and w which is a, a dynamic uh, democracy. And, um, and I think that people are entitled to question and to probe uh, as long as it is fair-minded, and we have that in the media as well. 
Thank you. Okay, so a little bit further down. Um, how long have we got? Ten minutes. So there's a man right in the centre, and then we'll come down to you after. Uh, thank you, Chief Rabbi. Thank you, Jake. Um, obviously, I'm not a Jew. Uh, so my question is, how can non-Jews to support the Jewish community in the UK and in Israel? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that is such a lovely question. <clears throat> and, and I think just by asking the question, you've already achieved something. You've, you've got an applause. <laughs> we appreciate all the help and all the support we can get. And, uh, you know, um, when people like yourself, you've obviously come, you've made the effort to come here this evening. Thank you very much. And you want to help and you want to assist. We appreciate that help and assistance enormously. Um, and we would ask of everybody, please be vocal. Please uh, help to drown out the unfair criticism, the anti-Semitism that exists. Uh, and please carry on your support and those of, of your friends. Uh, and thank you so much for being here. Yeah, yeah. Right, so we'll come down here. There's a lady here, uh, just there. Um, so you've spoken about the unity amongst Jewish people, and you've said how nice it is that we can get on with the reform and the liberal and more secular. Uh, there's a group of Jewish people who, uh, particularly in Israel, have caused a lot of problems, uh, and I've noticed a lack of them at a lot of the marches and the rallies and the um, vigils that we all go on, you know, who are uh, the Haredim. And uh, you say, discuss it head on. But how can you discuss something head on with people if they won't even look at you, let alone talk to you? Um, and we, you haven't mentioned that, the unity with them. Uh, I don't know if you want to, maybe it's not uh, appropriate, but... Um, I, always, I, do, I struggle a lot when you talk about unity amongst all of us. Uh, great, but how would we ever tackle that? And I okay. think that's all been massive in Israel, and I see it here as well. It's, uh, it's really been noticeable on where are the black hats and all the, walk, all the marches and stuff that we all go on. And of course, I suppose I would add to that the Naturae Carter are the most well, vivid yeah, example of, of uh, the, mo the most problematic yeah, but that's for most right, of us. Yeah. Um, so Rabbi, how would you, Chief Rabbi, how would you answer that question? I don't think that one can generalize about any particular group of people. And so I myself would not refer to the Haredim because you have many levels um, of Haredi ideology and, and practice. Um, and um, my nephew is the commander of a unit of the army called Hanachal Haredi, um, which is comprised of Haredi soldiers. And since the 7th of October, the number's steadily going up. I think it's now more than 3,000 yeah. mm -hmm. Haredim have enlisted into Tsahal. So, so I, I wouldn't generalize, but I, I do understand your question. And, and certainly, um, with reference to pre-7th of October times in Israel, it wasn't just judicial reform that brought people out onto the streets. It was a whole host of things, including a divide between religious and secular, uh, which is tragic. Uh, for us to witness. And this is one of the areas in which I am hopeful that after this war, uh, we will need to address many issues within Israeli society and within Judaism around the world. And this certainly needs to be one. We need to focus our attention on differences that exist. Uh, and we need to remove hatred. Uh, we need to build greater trust. Uh, and there needs to be a lot of healing because certainly everything I said about Jewish unity applies to every single Jewish person. Okay, thank you. All right, coming down. Um, Mum, did you ask a question? No? Okay. <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> I thanked everybody who, who made this happen apart from my mum, so without, without her. <laughs> okay, uh, the gentleman here with the yellow tie. If I may ask the Chief Rabbi, 
Uh, you raised a very interesting point with your lovely story about the black dot on the large piece of uh, white paper. And I'm just wondering whether it's a moot point that the black dot has got bigger. I'm wondering whether, perhaps on the contrary, the black dot uh, is always the same size. Um, and that perhaps you've underestimated the amount of anti-Semitism there is, that people have been encouraged and given the uh, push to come out. The anti-Semitism is the same. There is a large amount of anti-Semitism. And, uh, so do you think it's grown or do you think it's just more visible? Is that the question? I think, I think you've underestimated it with a small black dot, that it is the same size. And the, the other half of this question is how can anti-Semitism be removed when we know that Palestinians for a long time, children have been brought up to hate Jewish people? So uh, certainly in, in, in Jewish Torah writings, a lot is written about latent hatred of the Jewish people, which from time to time comes to the fore. It's part of human nature. Uh, and I think that uh, it's a mark of success when one prevents um, such sentiment from rising its ugly head. Um, because sometimes, you know, you could have a, a cool peace, but it's, it's peace nonetheless. Uh, for example, the peace that Israel has enjoyed with Egypt and with Jordan uh, hasn't been the most productive. Um, uh, we haven't been passionate about it, but at least it's basically kept a lid on something, and that in itself is a success. Does that mean that people in those countries all love us enormously? Possibly not, but at least we're able to maintain peace, and I think there is some value where that is the situation. Uh, of at least having an environment in which um, it is not conducive and not appropriate uh, for people to engage in anti-Semitic uh, conduct. And bottom line, what matters most of all is not whether people are anti-Semites or not, but what's happening on the ground. What is life like and uh, how are we existing? Uh, of course, <laughs> the more anti-Semitism there is in people's hearts, the greater is the potential, and then given a chance when it becomes national policy, as one saw in the 1930s uh, in some places in Europe, it can suddenly all just spill out uh, into the open in an instant. Um, to what degree is that the case in the UK? I am not a greater expert than you are, but what gives me enormous encouragement is the genuine love of the Jewish people and regard for the Jewish people that I encounter all over the place, unsolicited. We have many, many friends. So yes, perhaps the black dot might be bigger than it actually is, or it was always the size, but now we're realizing it uh, for the first time. Um, but there is no doubt that the vast majority of, of British people relate positively to us, are our friends, uh, and, and we can, uh, and, and that is why I am encouraged to believe that we do have a good future uh, in this country. Um, this, was that? I think, I think that covers it. Okay. Um, All right. Oh, sorry, yes. Oh, the, yes, yes. Brainwashing, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So th what you've raised there is, is, is a really serious issue, and, and it has been um, ignored for too long, or... Uh, we surely should have prioritized this because the way people are educated uh, produces uh, the way that they will be in their adulthood. And of course, we should be perturbed as well about the impacts of the current war on young people who are growing up knowing only violence and being taught that it's all Israel's fault. So therefore, while, please God, this war will be over one day, and let's hope that happens as soon as possible, our problems will not be over. Uh, and in the field of education, uh, I think this country and many other countries have a role to play to guarantee um, that uh, we stop uh, education in a formal sense in classrooms um, in, in, in Palestinian areas uh, through which people, ch kids are indoctrinated 
to hate Jewish people and eventually become terrorists. So that is certainly a, a matter of priority for us. Okay, Just thank you. Which government do you mean? I have heard um, our government ministers from time to time speaking out about this. It is a matter uh, that is known, but it certainly uh, is something which um, we need continuously uh, to highlight uh, and for action to take place on. Now, I think we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to conclude with a, one final question from here. Uh, first of all, um, should, should everybody subscribe to the JC? <laughs> <laughs> yes or yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he said it. Uh, no, um, Sandra Levy uh, emailed in and said, which I thought would be a nice question to end on, Rabbi Mervis, do you have any cause for optimism today? Oh, yes. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I, I hope that you will have noticed in my comments this evening, um, I have reflected elements of hope. Uh, a lot of positivity. Uh, we have to be responsible to recognize danger. And, and you'll recall that that was the very first point that I made, because it is real. Uh, we can't close our eyes to it. Um, and it is a recognition which must prompt decisive and responsible action at all levels. Uh, together with that, uh, I am enormously encouraged through the friendship and support that I do see uh, from outside of the Jewish community. I'm also encouraged by the incredible Jewish world. You know, look, look at what is transpiring. What a horrific dilemma we've been placed in. What evil people have perpetrated this deed and continue to do that through keeping the hostages. And the worst thing they're doing is the evil towards their own people. And in the midst of all of this, we've come together and, um, and we're united and we are absolutely determined to do what is right and responsible to preserve the Jewish state, to bring the hostages back home, and also to question the fact that people are asking about ethical standards, the morality of, of, of war, that's a healthy thing. We have to be asking these questions. We need to determine, are we doing the very best at this time under trying circumstances? And somebody asked before about double standards, etc. I think we raise the bar for ourselves. We strive to have high standards. Um, and I believe that we're going a long, long way towards achieving success in those areas. At the same time, our hearts are broken right now. And uh, please, God, may we see an end to this hostility uh, and a peaceful conclusion as soon as possible. Amen. Amen. This remains for me to thank all of you for coming, JW3 for putting on this event, the JC staff uh, for being here, um, and all of our new subscribers, welcome. And finally, <laughs> a big thanks to the Chief Rabbi, uh, Brian Lewis. Thank you.